Hello there, this is Brian Buchanan. Hi, this is Jean Deschamps. This tutorial will review assessment of the pericardium and critical illness. So the learning outcomes for this uh, particular tutorial will be as followed. We'll identify and discuss basic critical care windows. We'll talk about diagnosing and differentiating a pericardial effusion on ultrasound. Approaching diagnostic uncertain uncertainty methodologically to prevent diagnostic confusion and really try to integrate your understanding of bedside physiology with the hemodynamics consequences of a significant pericardial effusion slash tamponade. So the pericardial sac is composed of three layers, uh, an outer fibrous layer, and a folded over serous pericardium. The closest analogy for the folding over is as if the heart was being pushed into a balloon, forcing the balloon to wrap around the heart. Normally, there is about 50 milliliters of serous fluid between the two layers of serous pericardium and none between the parietal and fibrous pericardium. The pericardium separates the heart from the lungs. Really, it equalizes the forces around the heart surface. Additionally, it prevents cardiac distension and annular dilatation of the right heart given its relatively thin wall. Within normal right-sided pressures, 50% of right-side diastolic pressures depend on it. It can be affected by a variety of forces, including inflammation, thickening, disruption of continuity, and infusion. And effusion. So really, the most common and clinically relevant problem that you will see amongst patients who are critically ill is the pericardial effusion and its associated complications. There's a differential for any accumulation of fluid or tissue around the heart, and this includes epicardial fat, clot, pus, cysts, malignancy, uh, these different etiologies uh, will demonstrate variable ecotexture or pattern distribution around the heart. In general, the heart moves within a fluid-filled pericardium, pushing the fluid or material around, while tissues often move in concert with the heart as they are attached to either the pericardium or the heart itself. One of the key concepts that has an impact on pericardial assessment is echogenicity. The fluid-filled cavity of the pericardium transmits ultrasound waves better than tissues, Hence, they are generally more hypoechoic or anechoic uh, compared to other tissues. The appearance of fluid can also change with time. Blood is the rather typical example, starting off anechoic initially and becoming progressive, progressively more hypoechoic, echolucent, or gray as it clots. So really, the key objective whenever you do pericardial assessments um, is safety. Uh, you're trying to prevent a diagnostic error and to allow an accurate communication with different services involved in management. Nobody expects somebody who does POCUS to have a perfect diagnosis every time, but they expect them to have an idea of the gross findings here. And that's what we're, we'll focus on. So the most common cause for diastolic confusion of a completely anechoic space is a pleural effusion. There's really a high prevalence of them as well in uh, critically ill patients, estimated around 5 to 10% in some studies. A and really, that should be always the first question to ask whenever you have fluid that you can see on echo around the heart is, is it pleural or pericardial in nature? Both can be concerning, but the purpose here is to uh, find out the most dangerous one, which is often pericardial fluid. The first view obtained on any cardiac echo should always be a general assessment uh, view, uh, such as this uh, parasail long axis view, uh, with increased depth, as in this clip. It allows the identification of structures just outside the heart that can easily be missed or misinterpreted with a narrow focus. The most common view where they can be mistaken is the long axis view. In this view, the left pleural space can appear to mimic a pericardial fusion inferior or posterior to the heart. The landmark is the aorta, and the aorta is outside the pericardium and, pa and passes just posterior to the left atrium. Thus, a significant pericardial effusion will appear like a wedge between the LA and the aorta, like the clip on the left. Um, a pleural effusion will generally appear like a square shape abutting the aorta and won't be able to slide itself in between the aorta and the left atrium. Uh, additionally, there's usually a, a large tissue compartment posterior to a pericardial effusion representing lung uh, that is not present when a pleural effusion is the main etiology as it displaces it. This is an example where we see both etiologies present the pleural and pericardial effusion. In general, this is one case where one can appreciate a band of tissue that's really straddled on either side by an anechoic space. This is the pericardial pleural junction, separating both fluid-filled cavities. Pericardial effusions, particularly if they are circumferential, should be seen in almost all acoustic windows to varying degrees. 
Logically, the best place to look in the area is the interface between the two tissues. The long axis or short axis in the peristernum are good windows because both anterior and posterior fusions can be seen, but really lacks the diagnostic ability to assess for tamponade physiology, as the right atrium is not seen. You should be able to see this in many views. Um, the subcostal is likely the best view to assess for pericardial fusion because the RV and the liver uh, tissue interface accentuate the findings of the anechoic space. It is also the best view to assess for tamponade physiology as it usually shows both the RA and the RV quite well. Apical views are usually not as favored because the rib shadows can lead to an underappreciation of the effusion size, particularly lateral to the left ventricle. Um, as an effusion grows bigger, the fluid displaces in different areas around the heart. The best place to start assessments tough depends on the size of the effusion. Small effusions accumulate in dependent areas first and they distribute evenly as they grow. So the natural progression is an inferior basal to the left ventricle. Uh, and then it moves anterolateral in a very dependent area. And basically fluid moves up the rib cage essentially and ends up posterolateral to the left atrium. Fluid though will never accumulate in the posterior segments of the heart behind the left atrium as an example uh, because of the folds of pericardium we talked about earlier. As such, the first view to diagnose a small fusion is actually the parasternal long axis of parasternal short axis views. A common cause for pericardial separation that can really uh, fool the novice eye is the epicardial fat pad. It looks like an even layer of material, usually has a, a mixed or echogenic texture brighter than fluid, and it moves in concert with each heart contraction. While it sounds straightforward, in the case of, inf in, in the case of inflammatory fusion, malignant tissue or clot it can become much less obvious. Pericardial fluid can also accumulate at the atrial caval junction. This is an excellent place to assess for its presence. In this case, the fluid is likely surrounding the right, the right atrium, the lowest pressure chamber of the heart, and this is the first to collapse in tamponade. This should really be a red flag in, in this assessment. Assessing size is important, mostly for etiology determination, and a really frequent question is, does size matter? Now, effusions should be measured in and diastole. Effusions that are only seen in systole are usually less than 25 milliliters of fluid and clinically insignificant. The size to volume relationship is very variably reported, but in general, an effusion less than five millimeters in diastole corresponds to about 50 to 100 milliliters and is defined as minimal. And an effusion more than 20 millimeters corresponds to more than 500 milliliters of fluid and is considered large. So we'll ask you, we can see here on this image in the bottom right, there's, you know, depending on where you measure this, you might get a, a different size of measurement. So where would you recommend someone measures for the size of an effusion at end diastole? Fluid will tend to accumulate in the more dependent areas, which often is going to be around the left ventricle. Uh, in this case, on the bottom, you can see actually the apex and the RV section is, is more, has more fluid. And really the RV and the RA are the areas that will usually collapse first. So bigger fluid region that bigger accumulation of fluid in that region is actually probably more concerning. In general, what I would recommend is measure at different places and do an approximation based on different views of what the average size of effusion would be. Um, the effusion size also, if you look in this clip as an example, can be overestimated as a result of the angle of 2D cut through the planes. Uh, if you look at this clip specifically, as you're going through closer to the apex, you can see the effusion looks huge, but that's just because you're cutting through a, a full slice of fluid instead of cutting through tissue. There really are no tricks or specific standardization methods to measure effusions other than using multiple standard views, multiple measures, as we just said, and clinical judgment. So this is probably something that would be considered at least a moderate effusion. Size is usually not related to hemodynamic impact. The pericardium is a fibrous structure and can distend, but not acutely and not without limits. While tamponade can happen with any volume, in general, the volume which it happens informs the acuity of the accumulation. As such, a small fusion with tamponade physiology reflects rapid accumulation, such as an acute bleed from a penetrating wound. A large effusion without clinical tamponade reflects slow accumulation, such as malignancy. It is not uncommon for a neoplastic effusion to have around one to 1.2 liters of fluid. So just consider that really the size is, does not really correlate all that well with its impact on the hemodynamic sequelae. Pericardial pressures do not strictly determine when a chamber collapse or tamponade happens. Uh, this really depends on transcardiac pressure. 
as in the difference between the intracardiac pressures and the pericardial pressure. As an example, in severe pulmonary hypertension, the right side of pressures are extremely high, and thus the pericardial pressure has to be quite high, higher than the right side of the pressure to, for the chambers to collapse. In general, however, mild tamponade in a non-complicated heart occurs at pericardial pressures more than 10 millimeters of mercury, and severe tamponade at pericardial pressures more than 15 millimeters of mercury, reflecting no more right-sided pressures. Tamponade physiology occurs when the pressure in the pericardium exceeds the pressure in the cardiac chambers, as we just said, and results in impaired cardiac feeling. So the low-pressure atria are typically affected before the higher-pressure ventricles. Indeed, one of the most sensitive signs for cardiac tamponade is right atrial collapse. Essentially, the chamber collapse starts happening when the pericardial pressure exceeds the RA pressure, around 10 millimeters of mercury for most people. And it stays so until the filling pressure are increased again, as in after the tricuspid valve closes, when filling from the rest of the body leads to reaccumulation in the right atrium. The best way to time this is to look for uh, RA collapse prior to the tricuspid valve closure by 2D, or if you have AKG leads installed prior to the QRS. The longer duration of collapse is indeed associated with a greater likelihood of cardiac tamponade because it means you get to fill more to be able to re-expand. Probably one of the most commonly recognized features of tamponade is right particular diastolic collapse. This is the second cardiac chamber to collapse and is really best appreciated from the person along axis or a subcostal four-chamber window. The presence of, a, of RV diastolic collapse is less sensitive, around 60 to 90 percent, but more specific at 85 to 100 percent than brief RA systolic collapse. RV pressure is lowest at end systole after it has ejected all the blood in the cavity and drops well below the pericardial pressure. The RV stays collapsed until RV filling is restored, usually at end diastole. The best way to time this is to look for collapse immediately after tricuspid valve opening in 2D or after the mid-T wave if the ECG leads are installed. The duration of collapse really correlates with severity. Ventricular interdependence is one of the other features that we see in the tamponade, and it's really a normal process that is simply exacerbated by tamponade physiology. Uh, in general, um, you, you do have a bowing of the intraventricular septum into the LV during inspiration. In tamponade, it is exaggerated. So during inspiration, what you have is you have an increased venous return and filling of the right heart. At the same time, you have decreased pulmonary pressures that lead to less forward flow to the left heart. The combination of both these lead to an increased pressure on the right compared to the left, and the septum thus will bow. Upon expiration, the process is inverted, and all of this, while normal, is exacerbated by uh, phys uh, tamponade physiology and leads to what is called pulsus paradoxus. The usual question in most people is, does a flat IVC rule out tamponade? Simply put, IVC pressure reflects RA pressure, hence tamponade causes a dilated and a non-collapsible IVC reflective of the, the high right side of pressure. The evidence supports this finding, as literature suggests that a dilated plethoric IVC has a 97% sensitivity for the diagnosis of tamponade. As such, a flat IVC almost rules out tamponade. A flat IVC in a suspected tamponade case requires careful consideration. It's really only a reliable marker in circumferential effusions. A localized effusion over left atrium, such as in postcardiac surgery, makes the IVC unreliable. Finally, it must be remembered that it is highly nonspecific, as a high number of etiologies cause a dilated IVC. A full IVC thus does not rule in tamponade, obviously. Hepatic vein dobblers do provide higher positive and negative predictive values, but are out of scope of this tutorial. Thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy this tutorial. Bye for now. Bye for now.